I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning and thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Eric Evans. I'm a committer and PMC member on the Apache Cassandra project. I've uh, been working uh, some portion of my employment on Cassandra since about the time it went into the Apache Incubator, first for Rackspace and now for a, a London-based startup called Akunu. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about uh, a project of Akunu's called Castle that we use to enhance um, our enterprise offering of, of Cassandra with. So I'll start by uh, I'm asking you to come back with me in time. We'll go 15 years to the year 1997. Uh, yeah, so these guys were really popular in 97, apparently. Uh, and our mobile phones looked something like this, if you had one. Mobile phones weren't very ubiquitous in 1997. Uh, your computer might have looked like this. Again, maybe if you were part of the technical elite, most people didn't have a computer. And uh, this was actually uh, would have been a really nice one, I think. And the internet looked something like this or some of it did. Uh, but that is to say it was all static HTML documents. Uh, and so our databases would have looked something like this. You know, we, we had relatively small databases, let's say you know, hundreds of megs, you know, a gig or a two gig database would have seemed huge at the time. They would have been indexed with B trees. Uh, they would have persisted data to disk as files on a B tree based B-tree indexed file system, and then we probably would have used RAID for the purposes of uh, redundancy so that we didn't lose our application in the event of a disk failure. And all of this on hardware that was, say, you know, processor speeds in the megahertz and uh, single cores and, let's say, SCSI disks. So cut just 10 years forward from that. 10 years is not a long period of time. And uh, obviously, some things have not changed in that intervening 10 years. Uh, but some things have. Our mobile phones are now smart, uh, very data-rich, messaging, images, movies, geospatial data, and probably more importantly is they're ubiquitous. Everyone has one. Computing on, as a, on a whole has become uh, mainstream. Uh, this, you know, wouldn't be considered exotic. You see a sea of, you know, MacBooks in, in every coffee shop, it seems. And the internet has become very user-centric, uh, very dynamic, and very, very data-rich. So all of this is to say that we've had this huge, explosive you know, uh, growth in data. The, the now infamous IDC report said something, I believe, like 161 exabytes for the year 2006, where an exabyte is 1,024 petabytes. A petabyte just still seems un unimaginably big to some people. Um, and that is projected to grow to eight zettabytes by the year 2015. So just it's an explosive amount of growth in 10 years, which is really a pretty short period of time. So this has caused us to, caused us to, to make some very fundamental changes in how we store large data sets. And you know, one of those changes is, uh, is distribution. So in the context of Cassandra, how we handle distribution is uh, you know, we store everything according to a key, and we create a namespace that encompasses all possible keys, and then we partition that up and give each partition to a node, and then storing something is merely is, is, is a matter of finding where that key should go, and then we store some additional copies and let you choose some mixture of asynchronous and sy synchronous uh, replication so that you can you know, balance consistency um, with availability. And so we've given up, you know, given up, if given up is the right word, we've given up our you know, acid semantics of, of predecessor databases in order to, to scale out. Um, the other thing that we've had to do is we've had to, to take to write optimizing. And the reason for this is that uh, disks are just way too slow. So this is one thing that has changed very little in 10 years. Um, and disks have always been slow in this regard. Uh, sequential throughput is not bad. 150 megabytes per second, 200 megabytes per second of you know, just sustained throughput is not bad, but it's this, it's this lower figure. The, the number of random IOPS um, is nowhere near high enough. Uh, 
And the reason for that is, as I said, you know, we, we've taken to, you know, we have by, by habit indexed things with bee trees. And the way a bee tree works is, uh, you know, it's a tree, and the, the elements that we're indexing are in the leaf nodes here at the bottom. Um, and when we search, you know, when we, when we perform an operation, it involves traversing this tree from top to bottom. And each of these nodes in the tree is bounded by size, and when you exceed that size, that node splits. And, uh, you know, this, this holds for all of the nodes in the tree, so a split can propagate up and, and cause the tree to, you know, to grow in depth. These, the, the, the search complexity of a bee tree is, is said to be O log n, uh, where n is the number of elements that you're indexing in the tree. And it's probably more properly like O log b n, where b is the size of these, these nodes. Um, but a single operation basically expands to potentially more than one random disk guy op if every one of these nodes, uh, you know, is stored to disk. So that's just, uh, that's a non-starter when you have uh, data sets and, da and throughput that's as high as what we have these days. Um, so we've taken to, to strategies like, and in the context of Cassandra, uh, a log structure merge tree. So what we do in Cassandra is, is we buffer up huge amounts of data, and when a threshold is hit, we flush it to disk in, in, a, in sorted order uh, to a file that is, that is immutable and is never written to again. Um, so this means that you know, with, with nominally one disk operation, uh, we, could, we can write potentially you know, hundreds of megs or gigs of data, thousands, hundreds of thousands of entries all at once. And so that's a much better value proposition, I guess, for a you know, finite number of, of random disk apps. So 2007, that leaves our stack looking more like this. We have you know, distributed databases with purpose-built, write-optimized indexes that we still persist to disk with B-tree-based file systems. We're still using RAID, but these days we probably use it more to aggregate for throughput uh, and capacity, so I think more like you know, RAID 0 or RAID 1 plus 0. Um, and our hardware is now, you know, processor speeds me measured in gigahertz, multi-cores, um, SSDs, uh, SAS drives, things like that. So what CASEL uh, aims to do is to sort of go that last mile and to replace, uh, I, you know, I guess what you could call the legacy portion of the stack, you know, the, the, the four big data workloads, it's not meant for general, general purpose use, but for big data workloads to optimize those portions of the stack that, you know, are still, still uh, 10 years old or, or older. So what Castle is specifically is it's a key value store. It's implemented for the Linux kernel as a loadable, loadable kernel module. It, it is write optimized both for rotational disks and SSDs. SSDs have a lot more random I.O. capability, but they have issues of their own and uh, they need to be optimized for or, or else you can get degradation of performance. Uh, Castle is versioned so that you can do inexpensive clones and snapshots. Uh, and it also sort of occupies that role that we're using RAID for these days. Uh, well, both for disk redundancy, but also to, to aggregate for, for performance and capacity. And Castle is uh, freely licensed open source software, uh, licensed under the same terms as the Linux kernel, and I have links at the end that, uh, in case you want to go check it out. So uh, as far as write optimization goes, Castle's algorithms are a little bit different than, than Cassandra's. We have this concept called doubling arrays. So if you picture that what's, what's over here off on the left is, is memory, uh, and every, you know, each of these slots over here as it moves towards the right is disk. Uh, you know, we start buffering values up uh, at, just like Cassandra does in these arrays. Um, and then when we, you know, we reach a point where it's full, we flush those to disk in sorted order. Um, and then we continue and we flush more of them to disk in sorted order. Uh, until that second level's threshold is hit, and then we, write, we promote them to the next level on disk. And these arrays, is, as they get promoted further and further over, they double in size. Uh, that's why they're called doubling arrays. So uh, like Cassandra's log structure merge tree, a, a merge is needed to read. So um, each, each uh, level is indexed. Um, 
to speed up that search, and we have bloom filters to, to optimize that e even further. A, a bloom filter is a probabilistic data structure, if you haven't heard of them. Uh, they're very small. They fit in, you can fit a lot of bloom filter in memory. Um, they're probabilistic because there's a small, small percentage, a uh, small opportunity for them to give a false positive, um, in which case you just go to your index and you find the value is not there. But it's a good way of optimizing away a potential disk access for if one of these indexes have been paged out. So uh, as far as disk management goes, um, Castle uses what's called uh, RDA, random duplicate allocation. So uh, the typical, typical setup we use is two RDA, which would take uh, every piece of data and randomly distribute it and a copy of it, a replica, throughout the, the, the array. And it reserves enough free space on each disk so that the, the total of all this free space equals the biggest disk in the array. So that if you lose a drive, you s it's a simple matter to copy around the, the, the replicas to, to get the count back up where it belongs. And uh, when this rebuild occurs, it occurs only on the data that's affected, and it utilizes all of the spindles. So it's kind of uh, the best of both worlds between the properties of a RAID 1, in that you're giving up one disk worth of space, uh, except for you're giving up one disk for an arbitrary sized uh, uh, array. Uh, instead of, you know, a two disk, um, and a RAID 0 where you get to stripe uh, your data across and take advantage of all the spindles. Uh, and this also, since you're only rebuilding the, the data that's affected, it's much faster at rebuilds at recovering than RAID, RAID is. Uh, this, this bar over here to the far left is uh, RAID 10 with eight disks, and then we had RAID 5 with eight disks. And then finally, as it drops down into the sub-hour times, is uh, two RDA with eight disks, and finally 15 disks with two RDA. Uh, the more disks you add, the faster the rebuild time comes. And again, these RAID rebuild times are higher because a RAID rebuild requires going over all of the blocks in the device. Okay, so the way we use this at Akunu for our commercial distribution, um, is we replace the log structure merge tree in Cassandra. This is called the, the column family store abstraction is where all of this is contained in Cassandra. And I described that log structure merge tree as, you know, we buffer up a bunch of data and then we flush it to disk in SS tables. In reality, what we do is we buffer up a bunch of mem you know, bu buffer up a bunch of data. When the threshold is hit, we switch it out and switch in a new memory table. We allocate more memory and switch in a new table so that we can asynchronously flush this, this, this older mem table. And when we're done with it, we just toss it away. It becomes unreferenced objects. And so this is kind of the pathological worst case for, for the garbage collectors when we're just running hundreds of megs of memory through the, through the uh, heap. So we replace the column family store with, uh, with one that is Castlebacked. And so then all of that problematic uh, memory management is now you know, done in the kernel, and, and memory is explicitly allocated and deallocated as necessary. So the, the obvious benefit, um, it probably goes without saying that you can, there's, there's a lot of performance benefits to be had by moving something like this in, into the kernel. But uh, for me, what I find the most beneficial is, is the pr predictability of performance. So this red line on the plot is, is you know, just standard install of Cassandra, and the blue one is one with a castle back in. So it is indeed faster, but I, what I find more interesting is that the, the rate of throughput remains more constant both in the near term and the long term. And I think that when you're serving you know, like, uh, like online transactions, that's actually the more important figure. Uh, that's a little bit more obvious it, when you look at the... Uh, at latency, this is 95th percentile latency, and so the again red is the standard Cassandra, blue is the Castlebacked one, um, and you know again this is 95th percentile, so you see latencies here as high as you know almost 40 40 seconds in Cassandra. It's very few of them will be like this. This is, this, is, this test lasted almost 26 hours. There's very few of them, but when they occur, you know it's 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 a result of garbage collection. It's these you know the locking of the heap. Um, you know, when they, when they do occur, they're, they're quite nasty. And so, uh, yeah, moving all of that into the kernel space really eliminates those sorts of problems. Um, and so that is all I have. 
And I don't know, how much time do I have? Five minutes. I have five minutes if there's any questions. Um, are there any questions? Can I tune it to lose more than one disc? Yes. You can lose as many discs as you want. Oh, you, you mean can you choose to up, to up the replica count? Then yes, the answer is yes. Or you can choose to use one, just no replicas. The 95 um, percentile long tail latency on standard Cassandra, is that purely garbage collection related or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Those delays are purely garbage collection. Okay. So, so sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead, Finn. Um, is there any development in uh, standard Cassandra to, to get rid of that, like uh, off heap or anything else? Uh, I was going to say, that the, the latest versions, that graph may be a little bit old, laziness on my part for not making new ones. It, they're prob it's probably a little bit better because I think this graph predates the slab allocator. So there's uh, the most recent versions of Cassandra have a uh, slab allocator that will make the memory uh, that, we're we're, that we're allocating for mem tables contiguous. So it's still, the same, it's still the same amount of memory that has to be reclaimed, but it's, it's cheaper, it's easier. So it's probably a little bit lower. But yeah, there's no low-hanging fruit uh, left. I think there was some idea of moving the heaps off or moving the, the mem table off heap which is basically what Castle is doing, is it's, is it's moving that off heap. Um, there was some, some proposals for doing that in, uh, you know, with just in, in, in the upstream Cassandra, but they, didn't, they didn't, haven't panned out so far. So I, I wouldn't expect much more than maybe some, some incremental improvements. Any other questions? So if I understand correctly, at the beginning of the talk, you said that uh, one of the problems of a B3-based storage is that you have uh, to touch multiple nodes to retrieve an item and also to write an item. It doesn't really matter. And if I understood, just verifying if I understood correctly, the solution you then describe deals with the write aspect <coughs> because then you collect all your information and flush it once to disk in sorted order. How does that deal with the read problem? So when you need to retrieve something from disk, you still have to go through the nodes yeah. or not at all? It, defer, it defers the read problem. Yeah, so there's so many things that you could do with read, including you know, caching, that yeah, Cassandra takes the trade-off of optimizing for write performance. So for the read, you're right, uh, every time you add another, add another SS table, um, you're, you're, increasing, you know, you're increasing the read latency by virtue of having yet another thing to merge together. So there's a... There's background com processes that, that compact those. Um, you know, they asynchronously run around and take two you know, SS tables and compact them into a bigger one and just keep, just keep working at that. And there's also a strategy that works more like castles. Uh, I, pro I probably didn't explain that well enough, that, that, that merging in castle that each time the arrays are promoted to a further, um, that's incremental. So it will actually, you know, put back pressure on the, on the incoming writes in order to make sure that the, those, those merges keep up. So that, that, that's one of the reasons why, uh, that's one of the reasons why Castle's performance is a little bit more constant. Though Cassandra does have a, a, a compaction strategy now that's like that as well that will perform those merges more incrementally. But the general answer is, we, yeah, we have to be main, you know, rewriting this data and merging it together to keep, uh, to keep the read merge more uh, bounded. Thank you very much for your talk. <laughs>